my name is Eddie Pickle and I'm a counselor with the American Geographical Society and I am here to today to talk to uh, Dr. Audrey Kobayashi who is the, the recipient of the Charles P. Daly Medal from the American Geographical Society. The Daly Medal is awarded for distinguished geographic services. It was first awarded in 1902 to explore Robert E. Perry and the impressive list of daily recipients includes scholars and practitioners who have shaped geographical discourse and understanding through their storied careers. Um, Dr. Audrey Kobayashi is the press professor of geography and research chair at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. And she's been recognized for her foundational contributions to understanding the intersectionality of gender, race, class, and national identity in the processes of human differentiation and how such differentiation produces a range of landscapes. As an editor and author, she's been an extraordinary con contributor to the human geographical literature. And in addition, there's a st strong public policy component to her work, focusing on the legal and legislative frameworks that enable social change, especially in Canada. Dr. Kobayashi earned her PhD from UCLA in 1983, studying Japanese immigration to Canada and her long standing interest in the Japanese experience continues with her current work. I could go on and on, but there's much about Dr. Kobayashi um, in our materials. Uh, Audrey, it's so great to talk to you today. It's wonderful. The, um, in giving the medal, you know, the theme of this year's Geography 2050 is exploring inequality and its spatial, structural, and environmental dimensions. Can you tell us a little bit about how your work has intersected with this theme? Well, I would say that my work has three strands. Um, the, the first is theoretical. I've been studying spatiality since way back, and especially under the rigorous theoretical training that I received at UCLA when you and I were both <laughs> graduate students there. Yeah. Um, the second is methodological, and I, starting again at that time, spent a lot of time studying methods of historical geography, went to Japan for two years of field work, uh, and thought I knew everything I could about the process of Japanese emigration and the process of community formation. That's what I was concerned about. But we can always look back and see times when uh, there's a kind of a turning point. And in the 1980s, shortly after I started my first job at McGill, uh, I was asked if I would be on the committee that negotiated a redress settlement for Japanese Canadians who like Japanese Americans were uprooted, dispossessed and uh, interned during the 1940s. So I did that and I realized that those skills that I had learned as a student had a practical uh, and even ethical uh, application in the real world and in my community. So mm -hmm. this experience, of course, brought me much closer to my community. And ever since, I've paid a lot of attention to uh, questions of human rights and social justice and also community organizing, because I think that those things cannot ever be achieved without activism. Um, so with those three strands, I've, I've carried on ever since, and it's always been very important for me to do participatory and collaborative research, and uh, that continues until today. Uh, it, just following up on that, it, it, you have been such a leader in the, the study of the, the conditions that affected the Japanese immigrants to Canada. And you, you mentioned that in your in previous statements about the, in your work there, do you find that that real, could you elaborate more on how your real specific work on a particular cohort or uh, ethnicity enables you to understand or generalize for other geographers in other areas and in other fields that might uh, reflect on equal promoting equality? Let me jump forward a little bit to the present day because I think that will make it a little bit more obvious. So for a long time, I worked on questions of anti-racism, of course, uh, spreading out to other Asian communities and I was very concerned with the uprooting that took place in the 1940s. Well, the Japanese Canadians lived in a particular 
part of Vancouver known as the downtown east side. And there were similar communities, neighborhoods in Seattle and San Francisco and Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And of course, everyone was just pulled out, uprooted from those places and the buildings were left derelict. And a lot of them were single room hotels and uh, boarding houses. Uh, those derelict places uh, became what are commonly known as skid rows in all four of those cities uh, with some differences, more so in San Francisco and, and Vancouver. Uh, for the last 10 years, I've been working intensely in that part of Vancouver with um, the community that lives there today, uh, the largest among whom are Indigenous people. Uh, and they live in terrible conditions. They live in uh, SRO hotels with uh, poor plumbing, with inadequate services of all kinds, oppressed by landlords, oppressed by a legal system, subject to opioid poisoning, the list goes on and on. And uh, similar experiences, especially in San Francisco. Um, over the past year, those circumstances have come to light in, in ways that have affected me more than any of the social justice work that I've done in more than 40 years. Uh, the pandemic started, all of the uh, shelters were closed, all of the food kitchens were closed, the public uh, washrooms and pu even public drinking fountains were closed down mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people were left on the street. Opioid poisoning, which we'd been working very hard to bring down uh, and had done so, uh, started to skyrocket. And, uh, but we had a whole team in place mm -hmm. in that neighborhood who were uh, working to achieve social justice, to improve housing conditions, to improve services. And those people were now out on the street distributing food, distributing water, uh, distributing cell phones. We got a grant for cell phones so that a couple of hundred people could stay in touch because they didn't have computers or newspapers or cell phones. Wow. And I, I won't go into any more detail because there are lots of details, but um, at this time of crisis, the need for addressing questions of social justice and equity uh, has really come to the fore. And I found that Geographers are very well placed to do something. Fantastic. Actually, that leads me to directly to the next question. You know, Geography 2050 has always had a, a strong attendance by teachers of geography uh, in secondary schools and at uh, the collegiate level. Um, what would you recommend to help them as they teach the use of geographic analysis and geospatial tools? with regard to addressing these issues and creating a more equitable world? There is so much. If, if I could boil down what I think needs to happen over the next that's three decades, uh, the single most important word, word would be education. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean just formal education in schools, in universities, but also public education. And I have been frankly appalled at the low level of education, for example, about the pandemic mm -hmm. in, in recent weeks, mm -hmm. um, at the ways in which the media and politicians can just tell lies yeah. <laughs> and be believed by too many people. Um, I, I think we're all very, very disturbed about that, that mm -hmm. situation. Um, so, of course, all educators need to address those issues. But Geographers do so on the ground. You know, they draw maps. A simple yeah. map can often say a great deal about what's going on in the world. Uh, and of course, interpreting the map is important. And they can teach about places. They can take their students to places. Of course, that's hard right now during the pandemic, but yeah. normally we take students out on field trips and we take them to communities and we get them to meet people and that kind of education that geographers do probably better than any other discipline is really, really important. And we can just do the research that is relevant, that has pu public policy implications, that shows the importance of spatiality as a human condition. I define spatiality as the form of relationship among human beings. I think that that's really important. We can uh, address all of those issues with students who just 
get very excited to know that they are uh, learning about the real world. And uh, I think that's what we need to do. It's what we've always done, but wow, we really need to renew our efforts right now. It, re it makes me think a lot about the, you know, the, the, one of the things that attracted me to the American Geographical Society, um, and you, you of course have the experience of, you understand us Americans, but you've got the Canadian and the Japanese experience as well. But you know, the AGS, is um, kind of unique here in uh, the U.S. in the in the convening uh, academic, uh, business, and government um, people to collaborate, and you know it, it seems like you're touching on some of the ways that perhaps could you could you speak as an academic geographer on ways to build rapport and and make political action happen or make business leaders more aware of their communities and, and act? Is there anything you would advise us in that regard? Oh, that's so important. Let me give you again an example from my recent work in the downtown east side of Vancouver. We've just achieved a, a, a major milestone where the city has agreed to buy up over 100 properties, renovate them, and keep them at uh, affordable rents. Um, increasing the amenities that people don't even have now. Um, how did that happen? It didn't happen just because uh, the media wrote about it, although they did. Mm -hmm. It didn't happen just because academics wrote reports and published them, which they did. But I think most of all, it happened because uh, tenants with whom we're working uh, in a group called the SRO Collaborative, um, work together with academics, with the media, with sympathetic politicians, uh, informing, learning how to make presentations, you know, uh, tenants who had never seen PowerPoint are using PowerPoint to get their ideas across. They're using um, art projects, poetry projects, a whole bunch of creative ways of reaching out to the world. And um, I think that, uh, those things alone are not going to solve public policy issues, but in order to change public policy, the public, the policy makers need to be reached. You need to get to them in their hearts and you need to inform them in their minds. Um, not that I believe in that split, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, the, the way to do that, I think is to have everybody involved uh, storytelling is so important and it's not just uh, silly. It's actually the way in which we start to understand human conditions. And again, geographers can do that and throw in some maps, throw in some PowerPoint mm -hmm. and uh, policymakers can be convinced. Are there other, you know, uh, other pressing phenomena? I mean, do, do, you're really talking about, you know, housing, uh, you know, is, is such a basic need there in terms of equality. Um, but are there other pressing challenges that geographers could help address that um, maybe we haven't touched on? Oh, my gosh, yes. Uh, racism, which has always been the, the core of my work. Black Lives Matter and geography uh, can, can say a great deal about how Black Lives Matter and many geographers are doing so. I have personally been involved in issues around anti-Asian hate that has surfaced. It's always been there. It's been there since the middle of the 19th century. It's often been ignored, uh, even denigrated but it's been there and uh, anti-Asian hate has risen to violence. Uh, I, uh, I know so many hundreds of people of Asian background who are afraid to go out on the street because they've experienced vi violence or taunts or mm -hmm. told to go back to their country when they're already in their country and, and, and that sort of thing. So that, that's a big one right now, uh, but, uh, the conditions of Indigenous people in both Canada and the United States, they're different because we have different histories of colonization, uh, but they, they share a great deal in common. And geographers can understand not only the social conditions under which Indigenous people live, uh, they can understand the influence of the 
past, the particular places, and right now in Canada, residential schools is, is a huge one. We are uncovering hundreds yeah. and hundreds of, of remains. Uh, most of the people that I work with in Vancouver are Indigenous, and their stories are both about the present and, and the present conditions, but they're also about the past and their relationship to the land, which is fundamentally geographical. And we have to bring those things together, I think. In fact, all of those things have to be brought together uh, in hopes that um, there will be more recognition of the extent to which race racism and colonialism still affect our societies. Yeah, it's it, it's just so interesting to hear that. You know, when you and I were at UCLA in the 70s, you could just walk down the street in West Los Angeles and you would meet someone who would, had been interned or, you yeah. know, was in Manzanar or whatever. And it, the you know, the sometimes I think in society, we, we consign racism to the past to that event that at that time, and um, and you're bringing up all the ways. Obviously, it's just slapping slapping us in the face these days, you know. Um, and that geography can play such a critical role in that. You know, it's 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 so funny to think about geography 2050. You and I met over 40 years ago, and geography in 2050 is less than 30 years away. Yes. What yes. what changes would you like to? Other changes would you? think of, or I would like to say that large or small, that could help move our society in 2050 towards a more equitable future? I think we need to keep on doing our research. Climate change is another one, of course, that's absolutely huge and people disbelieve it. Um, I think Doing a lot of research and throwing it into international journals is what we're supposed to do. But that alone is not going to influence either the public or the politicians, uh, maybe the media, some of them to some extent. Uh, but we have to work harder on ways of getting the getting geography out, getting just providing a means for people to think geographically, because I, I find with students and with members of the public, if you can influence people to think geographically, their worldview changes. Uh, and, and they're much more willing to address these issues that, oh gosh, some days I'm so depressed over the things that are going on in the world. And then other days I think, okay, well, let's get to it. Uh, and keep being geographers because that's the only way that we as geographers can make our small contribution. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you for that, Audrey. I think we're about at, uh, uh, up on time here. And, and in any case, that we don't have enough time this month to really thank you and to chronicle your contributions to the field of geography, to the, our discourse here in the United States and in Canada and really globally for your academic social um, work. Uh, all I can say is just thank you so much and congratulations on the, the, the Daily Medal. It, it is uh, a, just a, a, the least that we can do to recognize your contribution to the field of geography, Audrey uh, Kobayashi. Uh, Professor Audrey Kobayashi, uh, the, winner, the winner of the Charles P. Daly uh, Medal. Everyone, thank you all. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you.